welcome everybody. This is the final session or the final lecture in this session. La Flood, Fossils, and Defending Your Faith. And in this, this whole lecture series here. We're going to start up again in the fall. But I just wanted to, to take this opportunity to thank everybody for coming. It's been our pleasure. And, and we'll wrap up a little bit later with some other comments. But when I sent out an earlier kind of little poll question about the topics that people wanted to hear. <clears throat> this, by far, was the number one topic that everybody wanted to hear. I'm not sure why, but I, I do think that some people don't know how this fits into the biblical chronology. And I also think that there are a lot of Christians out there that don't have answers for the Ice Age or what about the dinosaurs. And so they're a little timid. It's like, well, what if, what if science has the real answers and the Bible doesn't. And so I'm just here to tell you, you don't have to be afraid because this book is true and it has the answers. And even today, I saw uh, 2015, the History Channel said that we are still in an ice age. Despite the, the moderate temperatures that we're having and all the hype, People still say that we are in an ice age. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But first, let's start at God's Word, because that's where the truth is. That's where our true history is. So let's start in the book of Job. And the book of Job is what, what most theologians say is probably the, the oldest book in the Bible, except perhaps Genesis 1 through 11, the first 11 chapters of Genesis which were recorded by the actual patriarchs and passed down, and, and then Moses compiled everything and gave us the book of Genesis and the first five books of the Bible. Now, there aren't, you know, in, in other books of the Bible, there aren't as many references to cold, frost, snow, and ice as there are in the book of Job. Now, Job did not actually see the Ice Age. The Ice Age never came down into the biblical lands that we know today, but he certainly would have heard about them, certainly would have felt cooler climate even where he was in the Middle East. But it's interesting because there are a couple of passages in Job that I think point to the Ice Age. So we're going to look at those. The first one is Job chapter 37, starting in verse 5. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. He says to the snow, fall on the earth, and to the rain, shower. Be a mighty downpour so that all men he has made may know his work. He stops every man from his labor. The animals take cover. They remain in their dens. Let me stop right there for a second. So it, it's, this has intrigued me. He stops every man from his labor, and that's in between these two verses about the snow and the animals taking their cover and remaining in their dens. When do animals remain in their dens? In the winter. Hibernation. This could possibly be talking a long period of hibernation, obviously not millions of years, like the evolutionists would say, but that's always struck me as, as being a little intriguing that this could be talking about the Ice Age. Now, the reason I say that, he stops every man from his labor. Would have had to have been an extended period because if these people were farmers or raising livestock or things like that, would have had a significant impact on their normal everyday work. So when it says God stops every man's labor, maybe that's what it's talking about. So let's go on in verse 9. It says, The tempest comes out from its chamber. The cold from the driving winds, the breath of God produces ice, and the broad waters become frozen. Now this word for broad, there's a Hebrew word, says rohab, and it means the whole extent or the expanse. So this could actually read, the whole extent of the waters became frozen. Now obviously not... not down towards the equator, but we know that the Ice Age probably covered a lot of the northern seas. And so that, that's very intriguing to me. Another passage in Job chapter 38. From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens when the waters become hard as stone, 
when the surface of the deep is frozen. Now again, this word deep is a Hebrew word to heme or to home, and it means deep places or the sea or primeval oceans. So you can read this, the surface of the sea is frozen. That doesn't happen during just normal winters, this happens during extended cold periods. But more than just evidence from the Bible, which should be enough, but let's look at evidence from geology. Because this does indicate that the Ice Age really did happen. Now, the difference, evolutionists will say that there were five Ice Ages over millions and billions of years, whereas or Christians, creationists, would say there's one Ice Age. So we'll build on that theme here as we go. But, but we still see evidences of these past glacier sheets and mountain ranges. And we see these, what are called glacial valleys, and these are where these massive sheets of ice, very thick sheets of ice, miles thick, carved out this valley through solid rock and sheared off the other half of the dome into a sheer cliff face. Now this would have been a massive, deep ice sheet. And that's not unusual. And we'll talk about actual ice sheets that still exist today. So these are distinctive U-shaped valleys in Australia, or Austrian Alps, I mean. Um, notice this distinct grooving through solid rock as the ice moved its way down the mountain. There are also what we call striations. These are, are gouges in rocks. They're parallel gouges in rocks from when the glaciers came down the mountains, there's a lot of boulder, a lot of rubble underneath the ice and the contact with the bedrock. And as this massive weight of ice drags these boulders, it literally abrades or scrapes off rock and leaves these striations. Here's other striations that you can see a little close up. We see these kind of striations in sedimentary rock as well as metamorphic rocks, which says that the Ice Age happened after the flood, when all these flood layers were laid down. So good evidence for when the Ice Age happened. What are these? These are actually real things. They're, they're called erratics. There's things that they shouldn't be. That's, that's why they call them erratic. And Many things could have happened here. This could have been a giant boulder worked its way down through the ice and went here, or this could have been during the melting of the ice and just kind of settled there, and where it landed, that's where it still is. There are many of these all over the world. This one happens to be in Finland. This is one in uh, Long Island, New York, off the coast. Now, it's interesting because this boulder material is not the same material that it's sitting on the beach. So it didn't come from the same place, it came from someplace else. No other reason than the ice sheets drug these huge boulders and left them in place right where they're at now. Again, we see these erratics all over the place. They're also what we call glacier moraines. And when the glacier is moving down the mountainside, it's gathering material beneath it, rocks, boulders, debris, and it's pushing that material out in front. And when it starts to melt, those glaciers recede, the debris stays where it's at. And so that's what you see here are these massive amounts of debris that are just pushed right in front of the glacier. Now we can see there, there are what's called lateral moraines where the ice shrinks this way and, and leaves the, the dirt piles. These recessional moraines, you'll see these at the end of every year, depending upon where the, the winter stopped and the melting when they started receding. And then you'll see what's called terminal moraines. That's the deepest extent or the longest extent that these glaciers move <coughs> down the mountains. And then we see these, these what are called kettle lakes. A lot of times these big massive chunks of ice get buried as they're plowing their way into the valley and they carve this big channel out and then they melt and the water stays there. They're called kettle lakes. 
We also have Kettle Ponds. This is a, a guy, a hiker in Alaska. And so much smaller, but same concept. Now, these are just these are just some things that, that we see that point to the extent of the glaciation. We can use all this data and say, yes, we, we know or we're pretty sure that the ice extended thus far. This is interesting because from the fossil record, we know that forests once grew on Antarctica and Greenland. Pretty amazing to think that now, but the tropical conditions really all the way up to the equator were about the same, at least to the mid-latitudes, and the temperature differential between the equator and the poles was not near what we have today. But these polar <coughs> regions, when they drilled down for, with these ice cores, they drilled down and they hit this in sedimentary layers. Ferns, and they also hit fossils of macadamia trees. So the environment was totally different at one time across the earth. Nobody tells you that, do they? Nobody tells you that fossils of ferns have ever been found in the ice sheets. Now, much of the northern parts of the United States, into Canada, Greenland, northern Europe, and, and Russia, and then down here in Antarctica, were all covered with ice. That's, that's the extent of the ice. Now, that's about 30% of all the land mass that we have out there, according to scientists today. And some of those ice sheets were 2,000 to 8,000 feet thick based on climatology models, right? Those are models nobody knows how thick the ice was because nobody was there that, that we are. Job knew about them. There certainly were people who lived where this was happening, but they didn't record it. We, the only message that we have is from Job as far as the Ice Age. So they were surrounded by bodies of water. All these continents were surrounded by these bodies of water that fed water through evaporation and then it condensed and dumped onto the climate or onto the continents. Now, I saw some looks when I started talking about in Yosemite how deep the ice sheet was. The Greenland ice sheet, based on cores, is two miles thick. The Antarctic ice sheet is up to three miles thick. Actually, if you would clear the snow and the ice off of Antarctic, it's the lowest place in the continent. So that's how much ice is, is on the, the Antarctic sheets. Now, because of all the evaporation that would have occurred, and then the building up of the ice mass on the Earth, there would have been massive tracts of land that were exposed that used to be ocean bottom. Now, based on, again, climate models, they said the sea level, level was probably 300 to 400 feet lower during the Ice Age. And when I say Ice Age, I'm, I'm talking about from a creation pr perspective, not five Ice Ages over millions and billions of years. So that's, that's my context. Now, this would have opened up land passages for people to migrate from Asia into North America. Now, we know this is England, this is the outline of England, and this is Europe. There is this whole area here that's called the Doggerlands. That used to be inhabited by people. Fishermen still dredge up tools from when people lived in this area. And so you can tell how much water had been evaporated from the oceans, it froze and was dumped on the continents. So, Lots of water, lots of ice. So what do you need for an ice age? Any thoughts? Cold. cold? Most people say cold. How cold? Bitter cold? No. Well, Just cold. Well, breathing. Just well, breathing. Okay, yeah. So really all you need is continuous snow, or at least more snow than what you would normally get. And you need cooler summers so it doesn't melt the snow. But as long as it's below freezing, 
you're good. In fact, it can be so cold, you don't get precipitation, and we'll see that a little bit later. So this, this whole phrase, it's too cold to snow, is literally true. And we'll see why that is later. So here's just a little weather basics. If the air's cold, it doesn't hold as much water. This last winter, when you were in your house and it was cold outside, what'd you all do? You walked around the house and you got zapped, right? Every, every metal thing you touched. So you turned on your humidifier to force water into the air. Because normally cold air is drier than warm air. So the average precipitation on the Greenland ice sheet is only about 12 and a half inches per year. The average snow in Antarctica is 7.3 inches per year on the coast, but when you get up into the higher mountainous areas, only two inches per year. It's actually a polar desert in these areas. Just by comparison, anybody know how much snow Yellowstone gets on an average basis in the winter? 150 inches of snow at the park, up to four inches or 400 inches of snow up in the higher altitudes. So that gives you a little different perspective of how much snow Antarctica gets in Greenland versus how much they get in lower, lower altitudes. So the warmer the atmospheric temperature is, the warmer the air temperature is, the more water vapor it can suck up and hold. Does that make sense? So that then allows more water vapor to condense as snow over these continents. Now here's the evolutionist view of the ice age. They said there are five major ice ages with hundreds of thousands of, of glacial and interglacial periods in each one of these ice ages. Now glacial period is when that is cold and the ice builds up, according to evolutionists. An interglacial period is when it's little water temperatures and those glacier sheets retrace or, or retract. They say that's, that's on a, about a 100,000 year cycle. But these are the ice ages, according to evolutionary terms. The Huronian, 2.4 billion years ago. The Cryogenian, 720 million years ago. The Indian Saharan, 450 million years ago. Peru, the late, or late Paleozoic, what they call, is 335 million years ago. And the Quaternary, 2.7 million years ago is when it started, according to evolutionists, to the present day. They say that we're in an ice age, as I mentioned, it's an interglacial period. And they say that because we still have ice on Antarctica and the Greenland ice sheets. So it's not totally melted, so they say we're still in an ice age, interglacial period. That started, according to them, about 12,500 years ago. But that interglacial period is called the Huronian Epoch. Now, according to scientists then, the glacial periods, those periods where it's colder, are actually dustier and drier than interglacial periods. That doesn't seem to, to make a lot of sense when that's supposed to be the period in which the ice sheets are grown. So remember that, they're supposed to be dustier and drier than the interglacial periods. Now, these glacier periods are supposed to have lasted about 90,000 years and then the interglacial period about 10,000 years. And then the cycle has just repeated itself over and over again for millions and billions of years, according to the evolutionists. Now, the tilt of the Earth determines whether it's winter or summer in the hemispheres. When the tilt of the Earth, when the Earth's axis tilts towards the sun, it's summer in the northern hemisphere. And it's winter in the southern hemisphere. Now there's a very interesting thing that happens though and scientists don't understand. But the temperature variations in Antarctica are in sync or they're in phase 
with the variation in radiation in the northern hemisphere. In other words, what that means is when the northern hemisphere is getting the maximum amount of radiation during the summer, the temperatures are actually warmer in Antarctica, even though it's tilted away from, from the sun the most. Again, scientists really don't understand this, but yet they say that interglacial periods across the globe tend to occur during periods of peak solar radiation in the northern hemisphere. <coughs> Again, that seems like that's counterintuitive, and they don't have answers for this. Now, likewise, when the tilt of the Earth is away from the sun, it's winter in the northern hemisphere, and it's summer in the southern hemisphere. But again, solar radiation changes in the southern hemisphere near Antarctica, they're actually out of phase with the temperature variations in the same area. Says that the coldest period during the most recent ice age occurred about the time the region was experiencing a peak in local sunshine, which means that the highest growth is in the interglacial period not the glacial period, which makes sense because the air holds more moisture when it's warmer. Does that make sense to everybody? Doesn't make sense to the people who are the glaciologists here. But this was a statement from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Now there are many secular theorists that, that think they know what ended the Ice Ages or what started the Ice Ages. And many people today are worried about an increase in CO2 that's going to cause global warming and melt all the ice. So they're like, oh, well, if CO2 is going to melt the snow, if an increase in CO2 is going to melt the snow, then a decrease must be going to make the snow happen or, or introduce the Ice Age. Now, this is supposed to be supported by ice core data. So let's look at the ice core data from one of the regions, it's called the Vostok Research Station, and that's about 800 miles from the South Pole, and it's called Vostok, it's about right in the middle of the Eastern Ice Sheet. They have drilled down about 12,000 feet to pull that ice core out of the ice. And scientists say that by, by looking at the the amounts of greenhouse gases in those lower ice core layers, that they can compare that to the carbon dioxide levels that we have today, and they can interpolate the temperatures over time throughout that whole ice period. Now, ice cores do demonstrate lower amounts of CO2 in the past. That, that does show up. And, and there's a lot of different things that you can talk about here, but, but as a general rule, the CO2 levels were a little lower. So if the CO2 increase caused an increase in the temperatures, what caused the CO2 increase that ended the glacial period millions and billions of years ago? That's the question. They don't have the answer for that. They think they have the answer for that now. It is anthropomorphic or man-made CO2, but man wasn't around 5.2 billion years ago, 2.5 billion years ago, whatever they say the oldest ice sheet is. So let's look at the actual ice core data. This is from the Vostok ice core. Ignore the, the long evolutionary time period down here, but this is a graph that shows temperature over time and carbon dioxide increases over time. The red line represents temperature variations and the blue line represents carbon dioxide variations. It's interesting to note that when the peak temperature occurred here and then started decreasing, that was 800 years earlier than when the carbon dioxide levels started to decrease. So there's an 800 year lag that it doesn't appear that carbon dioxide had any effect on what was going on with temperature. 
So the theory that decreased levels of CO2 caused lower temperatures in the past to cause the, the ice age, or the beginning of the ice age, seemed to be faulty because the change in CO2 actually lags the change in temperature. Let's look at it another way. The change in carbon dioxide is a result of atmospheric temperature change, not the cause of atmospheric temperature change. And this goes both ways for heating and cooling. The change in CO2 or the increase in CO2 is a result of temperature change, not the cause of temperature change, based on the data that we see from the ice core in Vostok. Does that make sense to everybody? And we see that the decrease of CO2 actually had that 800 year lag from the onset of what they would call the ice age, and it started in, you know, when that temperature started dropping. So let me explain this maybe in, in a little simpler terms that you might all understand a little better. And, and it starts with the, this whole correlation between temperature of the oceans and CO2 production. CO2 is soluble in cold oceans. That means it's, it's easily dissolved, like you would dissolve an ice cube in the water. So it's soluble in cold oceans. But as the temperatures of the ocean increases, the CO2 can't stay in the, that suspension of water, so it, it's released and it rises into the atmosphere. So let's think of your, your ice cold bottle of pop that's stored in your refrigerator. You come in from a nice hot day, what do you do? You grab that from the ice cold refrigerator and you pop it and what does it do? <laughs> and that's about it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, take that same bottle of pop and put it in your car during the summer when the heat inside the car could get up to 120, 130 degrees. Then what happens when you... All over. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's releasing carbon dioxide. As the temperature gets warmer, it releases the carbon dioxide. That makes sense. So when you look at it in the oceans, when the oceans get warmer, it releases that carbon dioxide. So something else besides CO2 levels must be changing the temperature. So that's one theory that people use, say, that, that started the ice age. Another one is, and, and this one's actually, this, this increased volcanic activity, that's actually based on some pretty good science. And we'll go, we'll go with that for a little bit more when we talk about the creation perspective. But increased amounts of ash and smoke from all these volcanoes do block out some of the solar radiation that comes to the Earth. We see that when we hear about the news. Oh, this is going to drop temperatures, you know, a tenth of a degree or whatever. Well, scientists claim that there were three massive volcanoes or volcanic eruptions in Yellowstone 2.1 billion years ago, 1.2 billion years ago, and 640,000 years ago, according to the evolutionary time frame. But they say the amount of ash that was produced in those three eruptions would be enough to fill the Grand Canyon. A lot of ash out of just three volcanic eruptions. So a lot of ash. So the smoke and the ash blocks out solar radiation, so that causes decrease in temperatures. And then this particulate matter, and especially what they call these aerosols, then reflect the heat back into the atmosphere. It's a cooling mechanism. And we've seen from real life examples, temperature reductions across the globe, anywhere from two tenths of a degree to five tenths of a degree Celsius. That's about 33 degrees of temperature variation across the entire globe. So a lot of change just with a few small volcanoes that we're seeing. So here's, here's one that's pretty famous. The eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991, that was in uh, the Philippines. It was one of the country's most powerful eruptions, cooling parts of the world up to 0.4 degrees Celsius. And, and that's 
a result of one volcano with a lot of ash, a lot of aerosols, a lot of particulate matter in the atmosphere. So that one again is based on pretty good science. Here's another one that's based on some pretty good science, and that's a decrease in solar radiation. Now, you'll see these spots on the sun, they're called sunspots. They're storms on the surface of the sun. And with these storms, storms there's massive amounts of um, just magnetic flux increases. And that creates these solar flares that come out of the corona of the sun and they emit gases. Now, scientists have discovered that a decrease in, spot, in sunspot activity results in atmospheric cooling. And again, that's based on some pretty good science because this is the reason we've been in this cooling trend for about the past decade or so. Now, scientists say that these come on about 11-year cycles, and that there's still some discussion about that. It's, it's not, you know, you can't set your watch by it, but certainly more frequent than these 100,000-year cycles of 90,000 years of, of glaciation and then 10,000 years of interglacial periods. So again, pretty good science for this. They do say that sunspot activity was less in the past. And here's a good record. There's, there's some early record of sunspot activity that indicates that the, the sun went through a period of inactivity about the mid-17th century to the early 18th century. In fact, very few sunspots were seen on the sun from about 1645 to 1750. This is a period that a lot of people will call Maunder Minimum. And Maunder Minimum occurred in this larger period of time that we call the Little Ice Age. That everybody heard of the Little Ice Age before. So this was a real thing. The Little Ice Age occurred and during that time period, rivers that normally didn't freeze all of a sudden froze for large periods of time. Snow fields that usually melted during the summer stay all winter long in, in the higher altitudes. But between 1309 and 1814, the Thames River in England froze over 23 different times. And in fact, during this, this period, on seven occasions from 1607 to 1814, the ice in the river, in the Thames River, froze over for seven months of the year. That's based on the, the history that we get from that area. And it was thick enough to hold ice fairs on the river. The vendors would come out and they would set up tents and they would sell their product. They would have bowling tournaments, they would have horseback races, uh, uh, wagon races, they would have parades led by elephants just to show how thick the ice was. And this happened on seven occasions. Now this term, the Little Ice Age then, is reserved for the most recent extensive expansion of, of ice in these mountainous areas that we have. Again, it's conveniently defined as this area from the 16th to mid 19th century, and it really impacted the European climate the most. And, and this Maunder Minimum then was the coldest period during this, what we call the Little Ice Age. And it was actually blamed for the fall of the Norse settlements in Greenland. If you remember from your history, the Vikings settled Greenland. It was green at one time. It's no longer that it's covered by an ice sheet that's up to two miles thick. Another theory that they have is that there's too much galactic dust at times. And there are places in our Milky Way galaxy that are dustier than others. And as our solar system goes out throughout the Milky Way, there's more dust sometime between the sun and the earth than others, and that dust supposedly blocks out the sun, and that causes ice ages. Another theory that we've talked about before is meteorite bombardment. They say over the time, 65 million years ago, there was this huge nine mile diameter meteorite that impacted the Yucatan Peninsula and it created this 190 mile wide 
hole in the ground. Now there's no evidence of that on the surface. And as I mentioned before, generally when meteorites hit, they bring a mineral called iridium. There is very little iridium around the Yucatan Peninsula where this happened. Somebody gave me an article, and I read some more about this recently, about in Montana they're finding fossils that claim to be within the destruction zone of that 190 mile hole in the ground and the dust that came from that, um, which they also say was the reason the dinosaurs died off, but that's, that's pretty suspect science there. Now we, we do see these. This is the Barringer meteor crate, or meteorite crater in Arizona. It's about 4,000 feet in diameter. It's a big hole in the ground, but not near the dust that you would require to block out everything, you know, so we have the ice age across the entire Earth. But supposedly that dust blocked out the sun, and that's what caused the ice age. The sixth and, and probably the most recent and the most widely accepted right now is what's called the astronomical theory. That's the belief that there are Earth orbital patterns as it goes around the sun that, that change over a million years of, of time and that they're somewhat cyclical. Those three parameters are the tilt. They say that the tilt of the Earth has changed over time, goes through a cycle that the, the orbit path around the sun goes from a circle to an ellipse and back to a circle again. And then a, a parameter that we call precession. Now, the Earth is a top spinning on its axis, and just like a top, it has a slight wobble. And as the top spins on its axis, the whole axis then has this little wobble. That wobble is called precession. Now, these are named the Milankovitch cycles because they were introduced by a Serbian astronomer named Milankovitch. And he said this whole time for the Earth to change its tilt from 21 and a half degrees to 24 and a half degrees is about a 41,000 year cycle. How he knows that? You have to extrapolate the data from what we know now, again, based on uniformitarian principles. The precession cycle is about 19 to 24,000 years, and this whole cycle for the orbit of the Earth around the sun going from more of a circle to an ellipse, well, it doesn't work out so good. Somewhere between 100,000 and 413,000 years ago, or, or that, that's the cycle. So a pretty big, pretty big you know, cycle pattern there. But each of these parameters then affects the Earth's distance from the sun. And, and each one of those caused those five ice ages that we, we see the evolutionists talk about. So let's, let's take a look at just one of these parameters, just for the sake of time, and let's see how much weight it holds here. So if the tilt of the Earth ranges from 21 and a half degrees to 24 and a half degrees, a three degree difference, and we're right now like at 23 and a half degrees. If, if the tilt of that axis gets more towards the 24 and a half degrees, that means the northern hemisphere gets more sun, or I'm sorry, less sun in the northern hemisphere, more sun in the southern hemisphere. But remember that temperature variations in Antarctica are in phase with the amount of solar radiation the northern hemisphere gets. So if it's colder in the northern hemisphere, then that means that it should be hotter in the southern hemisphere, but those things are in sync. So when the northern hemisphere is colder, Antarctica is actually colder. Again, it defies what you would normally think. So the other question is, why do ice ages occur in both hemispheres simultaneously when the changes in these solar radiations from these orbital variations should have opposite effects from the North Pole to the South Pole? So things don't make a lot of sense here. 
Now, even though some of these theories just standing by themselves could be, you know, have some possibilities to them, just by themselves, they have shortcomings. Now, no one can act accurately prove anything in the past as far as what caused the ice ages or these interglacial periods that they call, but scientists have come up with models, climatology models, but their models can account for the extent of the ice sheet buildup that we see across North America from the geologic evidence that we have seen. They only show the ice sheets going down to about the Hudson Bay in Canada and not all the way down in the northern parts of the United States. So in and of themselves, each one of these theories, their models, don't produce the ice buildup that we should have. Now, Mike Ord, who's a meteorologist and an atmospheric scientist, also a creationist, had this to say. He says, in summary, the proposed solutions can provide sustained cooling and heavy snow to glaciate the northeastern North America under essentially uniformitarian conditions. And that's what they live and die by, right? All the things that we see today are the same processes that we've seen over millions and billions of years. But their own philosophy, what they see now, and try to project that back, can't get them the ice buildup that we need, that we see from geology. So there have been uh, lots of marine geologists, lots of atmospheric scientists, lots of oceanographers, lots of meteorologists, all working on this, but they still don't have any idea what caused the Ice Age. In fact, Alan Mix, who's an oceanographer at Oregon State University, says, we've been chewing on this problem for 30 to 40 years. Ralph Cicero, the Dean of Physical Sciences at the University of California, Irvine, said, it's a killer. It's embarrassing. All these scientists, we still don't know what caused the Ice Age. Now, instead of blindly believing whatever our itching ears want to hear, the Bible does exhort us to examine everything carefully and hold fast to that which is good. So we've seen what the scientists say. Now let's look to see what the Bible says. Because again, if we look at the Bible and then use that to match what we see in the world, things make more sense. So according to the biblical creationists, the Ice Age was caused by catastrophic plate tectonics. And we'll see a little bit more how this merges in with the flood. But the Ice Age was a direct consequence of the flood according to creation scientists. In Genesis 7-11, it says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep broke forth, and the floodgates from heaven were opened, and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. I've shown this to you before, but these are tectonic plates, and across the earth, there's about 12 or so of these plates, both uh, oceanic plates and continental plates, and they, they move around. Kind of like broken eggshells on a boiled egg. Now, creationists believe, and, and even evolutionists believe, that the land mass was all one at the very beginning. And then there were massive earthquakes from a creationist standpoint that fractured the earth surface and created all these different plates. And that would have been during that breakup of the fountains of the Great Deep breaking forth. And again, we said that nearly all the volcanoes and uh, earthquakes happen around, around these pretty volatile borders or these boundaries between these sheets. Now, there's a, a boundary between the North American plate, the Eurasian plate, and the African plate, and it's called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. And it runs about 40,000 miles long, at the base of the ocean, these mountain ranges are 6,000 feet tall, and they're several hundred feet wide. And so this rift keeps growing and keeps pushing the continents a little further apart. Now, this mid-oceanic ridge is, it demonstrates that the Earth's, Earth was once split open 
and then you have this hot basaltic rock or lava that comes up and it causes this oceanic spread. So this is called ocean floor spreading. And today scientists say this is still happening. It's pushing the continents a little bit apart, you know, inches per year, whereas we think that they, they spread apart much faster than that. But this is just remnants of the flood still today. That's how massive this destruction was. We're still feeling the effects of it today. Now again, evolutionists and creationists both believe that at one point in time there was one land mass. And then over time, continental drift, according to evolutionists, small, small changes every year, creationists would say it's continental sprint where feet per second these continents moved apart. And they believe that when that happened during this continental sprint, that all this new hot seafloor was being created. So what does that hot seafloor do? It heats the oceans, right? That hot basaltic rock that's being formed or that was formed during the flood heat of the oceans, and a lot of the models say that it's possible that the oceans got as hot as 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So when that happens, when the ocean surface heat up, you get more moisture in the air because warm air can hold more moisture, and that temperature change can cause this El Nino effect, which can have an impact on the number of hurricanes. And in fact, many scientists believe that not just small hurricanes, but what are called hypercanes, massive hurricanes that swept across and changed the, the whole environment and dumped massive amounts of water into the air. So evaporation of the water was dramatically increased because if I have hot water, that evaporates quicker than if I have cold water. If the temperature's warm in the atmosphere, it evaporates more than colder air. So now we have to have a cooling mechanism. So there would have been a lot of cloud cover at the beginning of the flood, but not just during those 40 days of rain, but probably for a long time after. And we know today that low cloud cover can reflect sunlight and heat back in the atmosphere. So, volcanic dust is also a real thing. There were likely hundreds of volcanoes going off at that time, spewing massive amounts of ash, aerosols, dust, and particulate matter into the air, as we've seen happens, and that has a drastic cooling effect too. As a result of the flood and thus breaking up the fountains of the Great Deep, there would have been a lot of volcanic activity. Mount Tamboro on the Indonesian islands, it erupted in 1816. And that caused such dramatic temperature changes that in New England, they called it the year without a summer. Snow fell in every month of the year in England during 1816. During a June 7th and 8th snowstorm, they had drifts of snow 18 to 20 inches deep. That's from a volcano, a single volcano in Indonesia. And that's the temperature change that it had in 1816 in New England. So think of a lot of volcanoes going off and what that would have done to global temperatures. So when you have warm, wet air from the oceans that flowed onto these colder continents because of these cooling mechanisms, you dump a lot of snow and ice. So it doesn't just have to be cold, just colder than normal, but you have to have a lot of moisture and these cooling mechanisms that then will condense the, the moist air and it falls as snow. So what do we say about the age of these ice sheets then? Because the uniformitarian scientists say 
that these ice layers, you can count the layers in them and, and get the age of the ice sheet. And, and that's true, you can do that in these, these core layers at the top because they're fairly defined. But it gets a little more difficult as you get down to the mid and especially these low layers of the ice sheets. That's because the weight of this ice, this is three miles deep, the weight of that ice is massive. It compresses those annual layers and it thins them out and spreads them out. So the uniformitarian scientists then, they have to make assumptions for the bottom and the middle portion of these annual layers in order to determine the number of annual layers that there are actually there. And when you get down to the bottom, these layers are paper thin very thin, very difficult to count. So they have to estimate based on how many layers were above that and just where all their old age comes from then. In the top layers? No, in, in the bottom layers where it's not as obvious. So they assume that then the amount of compression that we have is kind of based on how old you think the age of the ice sheet is. Because if the ice sheet's not very old, it wouldn't have had as much time to compress. So a lot of assumptions that are going into just counting the ice rings. For an ice sheet that's millions of years old, the annual base layers would be probably fairly thick at the top, and then as you go down, those spread out and thin out. And so one ice layer at the bottom could be interpreted as maybe a hundred or a thousand or more annual events, when in actuality, it's probably just multiple events that happened in the same year. You know, we get many episodes of snow. If it wouldn't melt in between, we would get snow piling up as well. Then you compress that, and it looks like, because they're so thin at the bottom, that it looks like they're all just one annual layer that is set down over millions of years. But if the Ice Age built up rapidly as a result of the flood, you'd have thick layers at the bottom, and then it would gradually get thinner to the present rates today. Some of these ice sheets are so thin that they almost blend in. So the ice sheet probably really is thick for that first annual layer, but again, just many smaller layers of events, multiple events that happen immediately after the flood. And even though there's been compression, not as much compression as the, the uh, uniformitarian scientists would say. Now most secular scientists believe that the Antarct Antarctic ice sheet is 34 million years old. And, and eventually that, that pressure, because of the, the weight of those ice sheets, creates a lot of pressure at the base rock, and it starts melting. In fact, when they drill down, they've found pockets of water. So it is true that you can have melting at the bottom of the ice sheet. That forms almost a lubricant for these ice sheets to flow across. And when it's doing that, it's pulverizing, it's grinding down rock. And the surprising thing is there's, there's these Gambertsev Mountains that are about 750 miles across the continent, and they're about 9,000 feet tall. Yet the scientists, when they look at this, they say, well, these, these mountains look like they didn't have much erosion yet at all. So there's an article that was written in December 12, 2011 by Mustaine, Antarctica's biggest mystery, secrets of a frozen world. And he quotes Robin Bell, who's a geophysicist who has studied the ice in Antarctica for a lot of years. And Bell said, it's really hard to imagine that there are mountains under there. It doesn't matter which way you spin, it's pretty flat. The truly mysterious part of the hidden mountains is not that they exist, but how they still exist. That inex inex inexorable march of geologic time that erodes mountains away and the Gambertsons at the ripe age of 900 to a billion years old should have been worn down eons ago. So much for uniformitarian principles, right? 
even according to their own principles, they said there shouldn't be mountains on the Antarctic ice sheet. But they are, they're 9,000 feet. There's another article by uh, Robert Benchladder, a geologist or glaciologist and NASA scientist. He said that the observations of the last 10 years are, whoa, ice sheets changed far more dramatically, both in terms of magnitude of change and time scale than we experts ever thought possible. We were talking about big changes on the order of a century, and we are observing big changes on the order of a decade. So again, they're even surprised by their own uniformitarian principles that this is evidence against it. And I would say evidence against the millions and billions of years. So here's a story. Here's a story for you of how fast ice sheets can change. On July 15, 1942, during World War II, a squadron of six P-38 Lightning aircraft fighter planes and two B-17 bombers took off from an Air Force base in Maine, flying to England. They hit a massive snowstorm, so they had to turn around and do basically emergency crash landings on the Greenland ice sheet southeastern coast of Greenland. They all survived, all passengers survived. They had to, to live on the ice sheet for nine days until they were rescued, but they knew exactly where they were. They, they sent out their, their coordinates, so they knew where they were and they rescued them. They could not rescue the planes, however. The planes stayed there. So over time, you would expect some snow and ice to accumulate, but then some some enthusiasts, aviation enthusiasts, thought, you know, I'm going to go back and I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to rescue those planes. I'm going to restore and make a lot of the money, right? Money is always the driver. What do you think they found? They were 250 feet down below the ice. And they had drifted about three miles from the original crash location. They knew the coordinates. But the ice grew and moved to the crash location about three miles away from the original site. Now, evolutionists would say, well, this is hundreds of thousands of years of ice accumulation. Especially when we say Greenland ice sheet, 12 and a half inches of ice per year. I mean, you're not going to get that in, in 46 years' time of building up 250 feet of, of ice, not in a polar desert. So obviously, again, the uniformitarian principle doesn't, doesn't apply here. Now here's a picture of one of the recovered planes still 250 feet below the ice. These rescuers invented this, this device that heated the ice as it penetrated the ice all the way down to the level of the planes. And then they used hot water cannons to melt all the ice around the planes. They took them apart. They hoisted them back out through the hall, sent them to Houston, Texas to be restored. 80% original parts. So it was, it was, you know, in great condition. Now, I will say that they're one of the B-17s that they tried to find, and it was crushed by the weight of the ice, but, but that's because of, of the mass of those and, and a lot of volume that's empty inside, but these are a lot more compact. So it fared very well in the ice. But that just goes to show you how much, how fast ice can build up. And, and think of that, if, if that can happen 46 years, really from, from no real volcanic explosions, no real you know, massive cloud covers, think of what could have happened with the flood. So here's the creation model. It says that the Ice Age lasted only about 700 years ago, or 700 years in total, but it ended about 4,000 years ago. So snow and ice, based on their, the creation climatology models of, of how much volcanic activity there would have been, how much warmth, how, how hot the oceans would have been, how much water in the atmosphere, all these other mechanisms that would bounce back sunlight and heat in the atmosphere. Based on that model, they say that it would have only taken about 500 years to build up ice on Greenland a mile thick. 
and it answers how far the ice expanded in the northern hemisphere. And according to Bonds, it would have only taken about 200 years to melt. So what about the people that lived during the ice age? <laughs> right? Barney. Barney and Fred. So let's look back at Genesis chapter 4. It says, Lamech married two women. Now, this isn't Lamech Noah's father. This is Cain's lineage. This is the fifth generation after Cain. But it says, he, Adam gave birth to Jabal, and he was the father of those who live in tents and raise livestock. So animal husbandry was alive and well back then. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play the harp and the flute. They knew about musical instruments. They were creative. And says that Zillah also had a son, Tubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. These folks weren't dumb. They were created in the image of God. They had more sense than we do. Sometimes we don't have enough sense coming out of the rain. But yet all the pre-flood evidence of, of man is gone. We don't have any fossils of any of their tools or any of their technology. All that technology was gone except for what Noah and his three sons came off the ark with. Now, even though we haven't found old tools from before the flood, we do find these very complex tools, right? They're pebbles that have been broken up. But they use those for scrapers. We find these in ice sheets. And so those were what people said, well, these were the first man's primitive tools. Well, this is what people had when they came off the ark. You know, that's all they had available to them. And so they used what they had. Now, these are fairly primitive, but these are the tools that evolutionists would say are the early Ice Age or this, this Pleistocene era, this early Pleistocene era. Now, are you ready for the tools that we'll find at the end of the Pleistocene era? They're these wonderful stone tools. Still look pretty much the same as these, don't they? A little more sophisticated, you know, a little, little more sharper all around the edges, chipped off, but not really any significant change occurred between the early Pleistocene and the late Pleistocene. Now, from an evolutionist perspective, that secular time frame is 2.6 million years. If you believe that that was 2.6 million years, then you would have human beings making the same kind of tools for 50,000 generations. No technological increases other than I just got my rock a little sharper. <laughs> <laughs> right? Seems hard to believe to me. But from a biblical time frame, if this is decades, yeah, I can see that. I can get a little better chip and rock. Now, we know that Noah's sons coming off the ark would have been able to at least build boats. They had helped to build one. We see the Tower of Babel. They were building towers. They were building cities. These weren't primitive people. These are people that had a lot of knowledge. And these are the people that scattered after Babel, scattered all over the world. And they shared the technology that they had with them. Of course, they had to, they had to go find other resources of, of smelting metal and, and making bronze, that is, scope that out after the flood. But they had technology, they had skills, it just took them a little longer to try to find those resources again. They also still lived a fairly long time, not as long as, you know, before the flood, but certainly still, um, I think Shen lived 600 years. So still had a lot of, of lifespan. So they would have been able to pass down their knowledge not only to their grandson, but their great-grandson, probably their great-great-grandson. So generations would have received their technology. But most of the tool innovation probably occurred with, within a single generation. I mean, it doesn't take long to pass down a lot of your knowledge. Now, scientists call these the people who live in this area, not the Flintstones. Um, but they call them Neanderthal man. 
the man that lived during the Pleistocene era. And they find a lot of artifacts, a lot of fossils in caves, and so they call it what? Caveman, right? And, and actually, this is, this is more one of the friendlier depictions that I could find here. The earlier caricatures of this was literally a man, right? So we do know, though, from the fossils they've left behind that their skulls were either the same size or a little bigger than what we have today. Bigger means bigger brain capacity. Probably smarter than we are today. In fact, we see DNA evidence in Europe of people that are living today. They have Neanderthal DNA. So these people weren't cavemen, not half ape, half man. They looked like us. Minus all the facial hair, obviously. But when you go to museums now, decades ago, you would see this or worse. Now, do a, do a Google on Neanderthal man and all the pictures will come up. They look just like us. Guess what? It's because they were us. Right? Now, the earliest remains that, that suddenly appear then are across what we call the old world in Europe, Asia, and Africa. Guess what? Those seem to be, from what we know about the Bible and the Table of Nations in Genesis chapter 10, that's where all the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth went. Japheth went generally into Europe. Shem kind of stayed around the Middle East and, and into the East, and Ham all went to Africa. So these are the people who scattered around after Babel, and most people believe that the Ice Age only occurred about 100 years after the Tower of Babel, and that would have been around 2250 B.C., so that's how it fits into this biblical chronology. What happened fairly rapidly after the flood is we were still building up all the massive you know, moisture up in the oceans and things were still shifting around. Volcanoes were still going on. It was probably snowing in the north, but those ice, it took a while for those ice ages to build up. Remember, we said that the, the creation model says the ice age will last about 700 years, 500 year buildup and 200 year meltdown. So this fits in well with this, this time period around the Tower of Babel. So what about the, the sloping foreheads and the high brow ridges that we see in the fossils? Well, some of these guys have pretty sloping foreheads, and this guy has pretty high brow ridges. This guy has pretty high brow ridges. I wouldn't want to call, this guy's actually a basketball player from the Dallas Mavericks from Germany and, and this guy's a Russian boxer. I don't think I want to tell either one of those guys that they were ape men. <laughs> They're just like us. They just have different features, variability that God provided to all mankind. So some have high brow ridges, some have, have flatter foreheads, some of us don't. That's all the variability of God's created human race. We know Neanderthal man was creative. He created musical instruments. He painted on walls. Very creative. Controlled fire. They buried their dead. They had religious ceremonies. They were just like us. Real people living in the Ice Age, living in caves. Here's an example of an early musical flute that was found in a cave. And some of these extravagant paintings that we see on, on the ceilings and walls of caves these happen to be in France. Now, you always see these early cavemans are walking like apes, right? Uh, that's what they're supposed to. They're ape men, supposedly. But during the Ice Age, we see their artifacts in caves. They took shelter in caves. They went into their den just like the animals go into their den. And when you don't have enough vitamin D, not only the sun that produces vitamin D, but also the green vegetables that we eat have vitamin D, you develop diseases like rickets. 
And so in children, rickets is very severe. And so when you have rickets, you have bones that develop like this instead of like this. And so if you have rickets, you're walking like an ape. But doesn't this explain why the fossils that we had, they're not ape men, they were suffering from rickets, from a vitamin D deficiency. That makes a whole lot more sense than, than we evolved from apes. So the question again is then why were the animals so large again even after the flood? Well, they were larger variations within the created post-flood kind. They just continue to grow. They're just bigger variations. Bigger does have advantages. So I believe that God said, you're going to need some adaptation characteristics to grow large again. A larger body retains more heat that you need during cold periods. They need more food for a bigger animal, but less food per pound than a small animal does. They can move faster, they can make cover more ground quicker so they can migrate quicker. They even tend to live longer lives than the smaller varieties of the same species. And they tend that the larger species tend to be larger in colder climates than the species in the warmer climates. Same species in warmer climates are a little smaller than the, the ones in the cold. Now, we believe that God's choice was perfect. He knew exactly what he was doing when he told Noah, these are the animals that you're going to bring into the ark. God brought him the animals. Noah didn't have to go out and find the right ones. God knew the right ones. He brought them to Noah. They would have been smaller initially to take up less space in the ark. Again, even if they were the big varieties back then, it would have taken on the adolescents that were smaller, so they didn't take up as much room on the ark. Smaller requires less food, but he chose those animals that could grow or at least produce larger animals. I had a golden retriever dog. He was 90 pounds, not overweight, just a bigger dog. His mother was 55 pounds, his dad was 65 pounds. He was 95 pounds. People in the American Revolution were smaller today in stature than we are. So growth happens. But God chose those animals and he knew which ones were able to survive the changing conditions of the Ice Age. Dinosaurs were not one of those. Now, I wish I had more time to tell you about dinosaurs tonight, but you're going to have to come back next fall, <laughs> and we'll do another lecture series about the dinosaurs. So isn't it wonderful that science supports the Bible? The Bible is a true history book of the universe, and the bottom line is that we need to start here for the history and to read the Bible about the flood and about creation about the Ice Age and apply that to the world in which we see and it allows us to explain all the things that we've always questioned all of our life. Because we started over here in the science textbooks, we need to start in this book. That's where the answers are. We need to get back to the infallible Word of God. If we do this, we can explain many things that we see today. So I'm going to leave you with one passage, and this is my exhortation to you. It's in Psalm 78, 1 to 4. Oh, my people, hear my teachings. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from of old. What we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us, we will not hide them from their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders that he has done. My challenge to you is that we don't hide this in our hearts, but we pass these on to the children of the next generation so they know the truth and they can pass the truth on to their kids.